Hello! Hi there. Welcome to Microbiology Journal Club, where we know big about all things small. My name is Dan, I dropped out from a PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. Now I'm a fact checker for pharmaceutical advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit enabling the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and I have a PhD in microbiology, and I've mostly worked on bacteria, but I've also since then worked as a research integrity specialist, and I'm currently working as an editor for a scientific journal. Uh, every week we meet to talk about microbiology. We're doing an overview of some of the coolest paper uh, that we've seen this week. <clears throat> and at the end of the month, we'll be selecting one paper to do a deep dive into. So make sure to message us at microtwjc, and if something's caught your fancy, let us know. Yeah, you can follow along with any of the papers that we discuss um, every week in our shared Zotero library linked in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or tweet us at microtwjc. And boy, do we have a show for you today. Uh, first, we'll look into the Delta variant that has taken over the world of COVID in a very short amount of time. Uh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, how bad is it? And have we figured out what makes it tick? What makes it so transmissible and dangerous? Not only that, mm -hmm. we'll also be delving in to see whether the vaccine protection really does wane over time or is something else going on. Plus, more papers on the molecular biology of SARS-CoV-2. And we're now really getting to detail of how this molecular machine works at this un subcellular level. So when And also we've got more studies on uh, antibiotic resistance and what bare dentistry can tell us about it. Um, so make sure to <laughs> tune in. <laughs> yep. Uh... So the first paper that we have in the docket is hospital admission and emergency care attendance risk for SARS-CoV-2 Delta compared with Alpha variants of concern, a cohort study. Um, yeah, so we haven't talked about Delta a lot on this, on our yeah. coverage, right? I it's it's weird. I feel like like much. we got very, like once the vaccines came out, we got very complacent. And we, well, at least I did, and I don't want to tell you, but yeah, I, I definitely felt like, yeah, SARS-CoV-2 is going out. Let's talk about some real microbiology. And now, actually, yeah, it's come yeah. back. Yeah, we were excited to talk about non-SARS-CoV-2 things for a while. Um, yeah. But probably people have been tuning into other news sources, so you're not totally unaware of this whole thing where um, started naming all the different variants uh, based on these Greek letters. Um, and alpha is the B117, which we have talked a lot about. Yeah. That was the UK variant, I think, uh, yeah. that is often, it's often said. It has that D614G mutation, which we talk a lot about. Yeah. Um, essentially, it's the thing that's prevalent in the world. Um, this Delta variant came out through, I think it was made prominent in the outbreak in India. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. So uh, we so we've actually tried to cover every variant almost as it's come out. So we did talk a little bit about mm -hmm. B one six seven one two. There was lots of different B one six seven variants coming out of India, and this is the one that won out and is has been rampaging around the world. And we've been holding off because it's been it's the, because there haven't been much like research into into why it's 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 so bad. And this one yeah. it delves into like well, is it bad? Because uh, again, it's. <laughs> Because in the chaos, when you see like something new going out, you don't know whether it's worse or good, better or worse than the other variants. So you have to take some time to get that data in. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think also the way in which like these variants end up getting studied is also partially why it takes some time to see the published papers at least, like solid published papers, is because these aren't controlled, right? Like you can't control this sort of like environment, right? You're only doing cohort observation. So you need to cast your net wide and you have to see a mix of people just naturally through their own activities in the world, get some amount of people that are getting Delta versus some amount of people that are getting Alpha. Um, and we really can see that a lot of the cases now are Delta. And so in yeah. this paper, I guess we can probably switch out or we can go to yeah if we go to the table one that's like um, oh yeah table one i'll go up yeah. there yep so this is patient characteristics yeah. patient characteristics so you can see like this is uh this study i think was done um using any nhs data uh if you read the methods it's kind of fun to just see that like as part of this uh national surveillance like these types of research pro these types of research papers are embedded into into that pr process so in some ways what we're seeing is um like published interim analysis of what's going on uh with all the nhs data um and 
and you can see they split it up between alpha variant and delta variant. And in general, like we're seeing a lot. Oh, I, I guess you can't tell from this because this is all just um, this is the percentage of people that fall into each one, into each yes. category. So some of the their their different features, uh, they're coming from all over. Uh, England seems like a lot of people are coming from the northwest. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if that's relevant for the news over there. I think that that <laughs> was anyway. uh, yeah, that was a an early kind of uh, do, an early focus of the outbreak. Um, mm. There's uh, yeah, um, and the majority of the people that are in the study are also unvaccinated. So yes. I think that's another important thing to point out with this is that. Um, like they do have, there are so-called breakthrough infections that are happening in this cohort, right? They have people, uh, the group, I guess, is greater than 21 days after first vaccination dose or greater than 14 days after second vaccination dose. And there are people in those cohorts, right, who yeah. are coming up with symptoms and PCR positive, but they are uh, definitely in the minority. <laughs> yeah, um, so seeing yeah, like 72% mm -hmm. uh, versus, versus 74 so, I mean, between the alpha and delta groups, it seems relatively similar in terms of breakthroughs, I think. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think they go, well, so I think a big part of this is, so it goes back to the fact that these are court studies, so they're hmm. like looking at it, um, after, like they don't have a, they're, they're, <laughs> they can't control how many people, like they can't balance the groups hmm. <laughs> to make sure that the statistics works out, right? So like things that are rare events infected after you've been vaccinated, um, those those groups are very small. And the statistics that you might run on those might have really large confidence intervals, right? So it, it could be kind of blurry as to what the difference is, right, between those groups. So like if you go down to like, like um, they do it like table one and table two, uh, table three, Oh, you're looking uh, at the web yeah, version. Yeah, I guess. Uh, so table, th yeah, I'm at table three. We're looking at uh, unvaccinated or people who aren't fully vaccinated. Um, yeah, yeah. So here they wanted to compare, right, between vaccinated and unvaccinated to see. Actually, they make a comment that like these confidence intervals that they're running, so like the adjusted hazard ratio. Mm. Um, if you look at the numbers in the brackets, like that's like a really big range. Yeah. <laughs> Right, that that spans around the actual number. So you know, hazard ratio is 1.43 for this is um, for sorry in admission it's like 2.23 and 1.94. Okay, those numbers are different, right? So like mm. there's some difference between them, but uh, the hazard ratios around them are ranging from like 1.29 to 4.16 or 0 0.47 to 8.05. Like those are really big, and that's driven by the fact that the comparator group is really small. Right. Like yes. the people who are these these are small amounts of people that are getting admitted into the hospital. Right. Who are um, who are who are vaccinated um, and even in the unvaccinated group, I guess. Well, it's 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 larger. Right. You can see the absolute numbers. Right. It's like 500 in the alpha variant, 100 versus 47 and 228. Yeah. And I think <clears> the, the point that I think they don't mention this paper, but like at this point, like the UK is about 70 percent vaccinated. So mm -hmm. the fact, so if the vaccine wasn't working, you'd expect seventy percent of the population to be vaccinated in this cohort. But actually, that's reverse. Right. So it, yes. <laughs> so, the, so it does definitely show that the vaccine is still working against Delta, but and yeah. Delta seems to be ram, r going straight through unvaccinated population. But yeah, there are some like I say, rel but it's a relatively rare event. So it's it's something that happens. But uh, right. and actually in this. Uh, so they, yeah, these are all hospital admissions, by the way, right? Yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah. In 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 table. Oh, you mean you mean the whole uh, cohort? I'm thinking. Yeah, I'm wondering if it, I think it might be the whole cohort. Um. Yeah, I think they have to be. It says hospital attendance categorization. Yeah. Fourteen days surveillance of activities. No, I think they just have to. I don't think they have to go to the hospital to get, um, they just have to be, they just have to have be right. tested. Okay. Yeah. They just have to be like, um, yeah, it's just all, it's just positive cases, right? Cause there are, there are people in this cohort that did not go into right. the hospital. <clears throat> yep. <clears throat> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and so what so what can this paper tell us, right? So I, we kind of like danced around, like sort of like these are some of the caveats mm. we should know, right, about the study population that's going into it. Um, but what they were trying to get at and what the title really uh, tries to point us towards is, um, is Delta, <laughs> right, uh, when it comes to hospital admissions. Um, and so I think for that, so table three is like they're extending it to try to vaccinate unvaccinated, but really table one, I think, is going to be their um, primary uh, takeaway here. <laughs> I thought it was, ta oh yeah, table one, okay. The Yeah, or I guess table two works, oh yeah, table two actually, you know, table two. Yeah. T table... Ta table one, you see the raw numbers, but table two, they're doing the actual hazard ratio. <laughs> yeah, in which case, I think they, they find that, the, yes, the Delta variant is more associated with uh, people uh, go going to hospital. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, like, we know that that could be driven underlying by the fact that maybe it's more transmissible, so more people are getting it, right? So then if more people are getting it, then more people are showing up in the hospital with it. Um, I'm not sure if they adjust for anything like that when they do their analysis. I didn't dive that deeply into it. But, yeah, from this table, too, uh, we can see that, yeah, Delta variant looks like it's sending more people to the hospital. But these people are unvaccinated, mostly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, and I think that's the the main takeaway from that that paper. So yeah, yeah, I think that's. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I think so. Getting more curious about Delta. So what makes it tick? So I found this paper coming up that I'm about called Delta Spike P six eight one R mutation enhances SARS CoV two fitness of the Alpha variant. So uh, so mm. spike protein is what the SARS CoV two uses to latch onto cells. And, and bind with them but that's just one step in the process because yeah. because it's one thing for the spike to just bind things it has to find a way to fuse with the membrane in order to do that it needs to undergo this uh, mm -hmm. process called furin cleavage so there's a site that can get that can get cut in half by a enzyme called furin and that's a very important mm -hmm. step in SARS-CoV-2 infection they because yeah. it's not in order to, it really needs that fusion that kind of this it's almost like a, a spring-loaded trap that needs to be set <laughs> off um, yes. Yes. And, and uh, we've, we've seen yeah. this. We've seen this sort of like these mutations are like a whole group of mutations, right? That help the spike protein get uh, processed easier. I think we've already seen that there are some examples, right, of mutations that have done this. So like, the fact that Delta might have one, right, is this could be one of the reasons why, right? We kind yeah. of already have some theoretical understanding to say like, yes, these mutations do happen, and they would make. Uh, they would make it more easy to have this processed spike protein on the surface of the uh, virus, and process more processed spike protein means more entry. Yeah, I mean, a bit of channel history here. One of the first like papers we did a deep dive on was on the this entire furin fur cleavage process. If you want to check back in our back catalog for that. Um, yeah, because it's not it's not just furin that is the protease that would do this, right? There's also this TMPRSS. There's also yep. like cathepsins. There there may be a whole family of different uh, right like uh, this is an interesting thing that happens in viruses right they rely a lot on different elements in the host to prep them up for uh success i suppose you can say and, yeah. and um inside of the human body like we have tons of different proteases that are doing their own jobs in our bodies so uh viral proteins will just have these like little similarities so that they're a substrate for those same proteases um and so they get the benefit of not having to encode any proteases in themselves they just like use the ones that we have and through evolution they may find more um they may find more efficient like formats to take so that they can take advantage of our our cleaving abilities yeah like because <laughs> like, cells usually need like proteases when they need to, to they stick to each other or unstick to each other. They've got these enzymes that modulate the stuff on the cell surface, and viruses can use that against yeah. us. Mm -hmm. And uh, this paper mm -hmm. kind of tries to figure out uh, what is going on with this P681 R mutation. Uh, so they, they do some kind of neat little mm -hmm. experiments comparing the alpha variant and the delta variant. Uh, so I'm going to pull you pull us down to the first figure where they essentially like they take bits of the SARS-CoV-2 genome and they clone it into these cDNAs. And then what they do next is they swap out mm -hmm. the spikes between them. So they go, okay, what happens if we take the alpha variant and put the delta variant spike on it? What does that do to its mm -hmm. effectiveness? Um, and yeah. what what it ends up doing is that it. So so this basically shows a like they do computation assays. 
Competition essay is a very simple way. You just put two viruses in a petri dish and have them race to see which one takes over. Um, mm -hmm. And they they find that the delta growth rate tends to be much higher than the alpha growth rate. And so, and so they're, they're, they're doing that inside of cell culture. Yes, inside um, of uh, Vero cells, I believe. So they're not exactly human yeah. cells. It's like a standard cell type that... Uh, oh, Kalu, or no, I'm seeing extended figure. Which figure is that one? That oh, you're, sorry, you're I'm showing? looking at figure one. No, uh, no, you're right. The oh, Kalu figure. One. Yeah, no, uh, that was baffling me because the Vero cells, it wouldn't work because Vero cells don't have the, the furin cleavages. So I was about to really rain a parade yeah. on this study that actually doesn't deserve so <laughs> um but yeah no they use lung cancer cells okay yeah so they are they are looking at calo cells so like um vero cells are the cells if people have been following along vero cells are the cells that uh are often used to do the neutralization assays and things they're like very susceptible to to the um infection more similar i think they are from there are some sort of like cell yeah, line they're a lung the cancer airway. line yeah um, and so, like, I guess there you can see usually more differences, right? I think the reason why they're being used here is like they can they can help separate a, a bit better the differences because if you can't fear in cleavage, they have a really they have much diff more difficult time getting into this particular cell line. Yeah. So again, they do these swapping experiments. They find that uh, they they compete the swap version with the alpha. They find that they. Yeah. The, yeah. The delta variant becomes less competitive if you give it the alpha spike protein. And which, yep. <laughs> which just kind of shows that okay, well that means that Delta's kind of ma 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 magic source is this in the spike, and they go even further and yeah. they put in a mutation in that P six eighteen R like section to mutate it back to the version seen in the alpha variant, and again they see that that yep. returns it to like the infectiveness of the alpha variant. So the yeah, so I love that. That's that's a nice like zoom in zoom out sort of approach of doing it right like the swapping of the spikes between the two viruses that's a really zoomed out version just saying like is it in the spike but then when they go into the swap version and they edit it back <laughs> right just the single uh amino acid back into um whatever other format or they they do it into the delta format and you see the change then it's like oh wow it's even like you can, I guess, zoom in even closer and say that it's this single amino acid is like driving a lot of the phenomena from the the spike switch. <laughs> yeah, and they they do a few experiments to confirm that it's the furin cleavage that that is changed by this mutation, and then they do the mm. other like counter experiments. They they go, okay, well, does it affect ACE two binding? Uh, because it could theoretically anything change the protein could affect that, and maybe if that's cut, but then they they run that control experiment and they find that okay. That does that isn't the cause. It's not about that. It's all to do with this P81R like kind of variation. Um, mm. So it's a neat little paper that that focuses and lays focus on that and tells kind of very neat and laid out story about what the what and it's so essentially what it means is that the delta it, it sticks to cells the same amount as other variants, but it confuses them much quicker. Um, mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. so, so that as a bonus to its transmissibility factor i guess and yeah yeah and it's really this is a great um sort of uh we're 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 narrowing down to that like really small key factor it helps us understand really that mutational landscape of of SARS-CoV-2 right because if we know that it's this one locus then who knows we may see it pop up in other variants well hopefully there's not too many other variants that happen during this time but it could right like this yeah. would be something to surveil for because we know that it has this effect um but as we've seen through the history of this pandemic like there are so many locations on this spike protein that could pick up a mutation and that could have some positive or hope, maybe even like negative effect right on the ability for the virus to be infective or cause disease um and it really takes right like there has to be um enough go and drill down to this level of detail on a very specific uh residue um mm -hmm. yeah to, to see studies like this but like once we have it now we have like this whole list of different mutations right that have been characterized <laughs> as yeah. to what effect they have yeah in, and like i expect to see further studies investigating this just looking because in terms of like Mem because fusing membranes doesn't just aff affect the fusing of SARS-CoV-2. You can create syncytia, where cells fuse together, which is kind of pathogenic as well. It can cause these other internal effects that might lead yes. to more severe disease. And I think I can see 
that's a future avenue yes. of research for this to try and figure out okay we've seen this one effect but now like it's pushing down multiple dominoes and what where is that going to lead mm -hmm. um and yeah yeah like this is one way in which this mutation affects fusion but like we've we've seen some papers before where they talk about cell cell fusion so like two cell one cell gets infected and then at but actually, it's a kind of funny. I think later on in the cryo-EM paper we have, it actually kind of throws a loop for this sensation yeah. idea. Uh, because we don't really... Know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyways, the, I'm, I'm like... But no, that's, that's fine. Yeah. We're <laughs> going on to like the next paper. We're going back to our, our cohort studies. Um, so this paper is titled Six Month Effectiveness of BNT162B2 mRNA COVID-19 Vaccine in a Large U.S. Integrated Health System, a, a Retrospective Cohort Study. Um, yeah. So once again, all the things that we said about the first one sort of apply yeah. here. <laughs> they looked at the... Um, there sorry. might not... Oh, no, this is based in South Carolina in the Kaiser Permanente Healthcare System, which is like this integrated healthcare organization that... I'm not really familiar with it, it's just, uh, but yeah, it apparently has lots of members. I, I see a lot of data sets come from Kaiser Permanente. I feel like, right, like in the States, there's there's no national healthcare system. It's just like different hospital systems. And, and Kaiser Permanente is a rather large hospital network that repeatedly um, has researchers going towards it. Because it's such a large hospital network, it has the amount of patients you would need, right, to do these types of retrospective studies. Um, and so often uh, researchers will go to this particular hospital network in order to pick out um, data. But of course, uh, one thing you can say is that they are by their nature, like a limited network, right? They're not, mm. they're not the nation's hospitals. <laughs> they're just like this network of them. So it, it can, you, you can sometimes view, scrutinize, you always have to scrutinize the, um, the composition data of like who is in the cohort, because like you might see some patterns that aren't representative of like your particular area or like the entire u.s as a whole yeah um so what they so what they did is they did almost like a time course to look at how how vaccine efficacy mm -hmm. might change depending on the days after that you've received the vaccine um yeah so uh what they find so essentially this is almost focused entirely on the BioNTech paper so this is actually mm -hmm. this this is a trial funded by Pfizer. So I guess they're focusing on their their vaccine specifically. Um, right. They want to know if their vaccine. What can they say about their vaccine? Yeah. They want they want to know about whether they need to do boosters or not. Um, mm -hmm. So which is fairly important information. Uh, let's see what. Uh, okay. I, I do need to download this paper quickly. Uh, open PDF and browser. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Okay, yeah, I can uh, say a few Elsevier. Um, <laughs> yeah, Elsevier just, I mean, a while back, right, purchased the Social Sciences Research Network and use it to distribute their preprints. <clears throat> yeah, okay, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, right, in that case, I'm just gonna have to, t uh, discuss, discuss this paper through the medium of words. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, um, so what they found was that, uh, that fully vaccinated individuals are like it so um so okay amongst fully vaccinated persons of all ages protection against for COVID-19 related to hospitalization didn't wane over time so essentially going into hospital the, the probability of getting to hospital didn't change so there's that mm -hmm. level of protection was fine but they did find that overall because this they, they were testing just for all infections not just one severe for it enough to take you to hospital they found that there was yeah. a, a slight decrease, I think, in in vaccine efficacy mm -hmm. over time. Um, so yeah, like, but I think similar to the study that we talked about in number one, like there are really large confidence intervals around all of these things. Yes, um, really massive. So like, yeah. So while there might be some small, it's like kind of hard to say exactly like what what like how how much of a difference there is uh, between Delta and or sorry, yeah, between Delta and the other variants. Mm. Yeah, I think that the thing about cohort studies is that there are so many other like conflicting factors. Firstly, age is a massive mm -hmm. factor because, again, older people, their immune systems might behave differently from younger people's immune systems. So, again, we don't know about the timeline of things. Uh, I remember, like, even yeah. in the vaccine studies, you'd see, like, tidy, co tidy like, kind of immune things until you get the older cohorts when you get massive variations. So, that... <laughs> 
Yeah. That could be a, a part of the fact that that's ha- happening here. Um, I mean, overall, I think the vaccine efficacy was found to be about uh, 73%, but it's just once you... Uh, and I got 90% against COVID hospitalizations. So it's still really protective against going to hospital, which is the thing that we actually care about a lot. Yes. But in terms of actual getting the virus... Um, but it is very clear that they they do... I do think that, like... Um, so, yeah, uh, over time, though, like uh, one yeah. month to five months or whatever, that decrease, uh, you are they are seeing um, some sort of decrease yeah. there so, in the yeah. vaccine. So, yeah, so... I think de- declining from 88% during the first month to after full vaccination <laughs> to to 47% after uh, at greater than five months after the second dose, uh, which is right. uh, seems to be quite a a, a dramatic dro- drop there for something that mm-hmm. doesn't that doesn't change the level of hospitalizations. So um, mm-hmm. so that is noticeably something to be like uh, careful of. Um, I mean, I think actually. To, to me, this is also maybe uh, part, part of the, right, like, uh, you can still get it, but, like, you're not going to the hospital. Like, that, yeah. I probably people have heard that message, like, a, a lot now. Um, but it's also part of, like, understanding probably the route that this virus will take in our society, where it's going to be like, yeah, people may get it now. It's like the flu, right? People get it, yeah. but not everyone goes to the hospital for it. Um yeah, it's not a good outcome, I would say necessarily, like in terms of like uh, the way it's being managed. But I mean, it's live right. Like we've lived with things like this before. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not ideal. Um, but yeah. I mean, the thing is, this this is just again one one study in one area, and there are so many confounding factors. And mm-hmm. uh, again, I do want to like kind of, so it is a Pfizer funded study, which made me think two things. Firstly, oh, that I could. But trust them because why did they trash our own vaccine? And then thinking, but they want to yeah. make us take boosters. So <laughs> I'm <laughs> totally, totally. So yeah. I, uh, so I don't know where I live on the skeptic skeptometer on this. But <laughs> 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 but then the next study we're looking at is is from the UK. It's another NHS based study. Uh, so this is based on uh, the COVID nineteen study or more affectionately known as Zoe here, where you've got this app that tracks you, and they essentially go out into Wait. the community and randomly test households. Um, mm-hmm. So, Wait, what, what, what is it affectionately known as? Zoe. I think the Zoe Co- COVID Zoe? study. But I, I don't see. know what the acronym is for. I I should have researched it before before looking at this. Oh, no, that's but... fine. I, I, when you said it, I was thinking like, oh, you guys call this app Zoe because like, you know, there's like Siri on your phone and you get like Zoe on your I phone. I think it's something like, to, I, I need to look it up now because, um, <laughs> but yeah, this is uh, essentially <laughs> like a, a study where they go out into the community and randomly sample people at, uh, for SARS-CoV-2 and they sample people mm. at regular intervals over over like a course of time. So, so the idea is that when they catch someone, they can also catch them throughout the course of an infection as well and so it's almost like a much more yeah. uh, it's a you get a much better idea of how of how much COVID there is in the population because you get a representative sample and also how many people end up in the hospital afterwards yes. and yes yeah so with this one it's like like uh this improves on the sort of the two retrospective styles that we've seen because um they're actually like uh, being able to to uh, uh, do like a broader sampling, there's the confounding factors in terms of admission. Although of course there still will be um, confounding factors in a study like this, um, they're 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 a bit abated. But a big challenge of a study like like this is like they actually have to do all this data collection, right? Like uh, be able to to go out and sample from all these different people and they may not get enough numbers. But you know, I also usually feel good, all of these UK studies, I feel like they're going deep, right? Like this is this is an interest in the government to know what's going on. And so like they're spending money to make sure they get um, a large enough sample yeah, size. Yeah, and say also like, uh, sorry, just looking at Zoe, I just, I'm, I'm boning up on it. It's actually the name of the private company that runs the COVID this testing. So and um, people talk about oh. like UK having socialized oh, healthcare, but we have lots of privatization in within this system so uh yeah like there are companies yeah. into the nhs yeah i was yeah. actually i was back in canada like uh two weeks ago and i also was like surprised like um like 
the, of course, like there's a Canadian healthcare system. I think it's less centralized than the NHS, but it's still like, you know, it pays their taxes into it. But for testing, a lot of testing is done by private companies, I guess, have won contracts to do that. Um, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah, C capitalism. <laughs> yeah, it's even a part of so-called socialism healthcare. <laughs> Which it really isn't that that social. But uh, yeah, um, so I think I'm gonna like jump to like because there's quite a lot of stuff in this paper, and I didn't really get the time to p figure out everything that's in it because it it pulls out quite a lot of different uh, data points. Uh, so let me see whether mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump straight down to the figures, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, and so, so I think the first thing it does, it tries to like compare like effect efficacy of the vaccines, uh, based on like the PCR positive episodes. Um, yeah. so, uh, like, so I think for, for instance, it finds that, uh, let me zoom in quickly cause I cannot read these. Uh, yeah, it's a very, I think they're trying to say that, um, this odd what is this oh yeah protection is the odds ratio yes so if you're lower down on it you're less protected i guess <clears throat> i think that it's uh more more protected you and like kind of this black line is if you're not protected so uh so i think mm -hmm. they use like kind of they use unvaccinated people as the controls here uh i think mm -hmm. i'm not sure uh let me double check really uh I th I th so like so 21 days after the first dose with uh, BNT uh, 162 uh, and then mm -hmm. versus Chadox. So uh, so essentially what they initially find is that uh, Chadox is, seems to be like le less good, um, mm -hmm. especially against like uh, Delta. Uh, and then like after the second dose, it returns back to that baseline of how good vaccines are. So it's still... Right. BNT, so it literally looks at BNT 162B2 is much better than was well, is a bit better than cat chadox um and then they compare it against people who have who are not vaccinated but have previously had covid infection and their their uh -huh. chances of getting disease as well and they basically find that the both vaccinations are in the same region of effectiveness as those people who have already had covid in the past um yeah but this but this effectiveness metric is uh just like PCR positive, right? There's not, is it symptoms? Yeah. Like, what are they? It's, I think it's all just PCR positives here. So they're looking PCR at... PCR positive with symptoms, yeah. Yeah. So uh, with so with CT430 is is the red one, and with symptoms is the green one. Mm-hmm. So, like, uh, after the... So what you hope with the vaccine is essentially that the PCR positives would always be higher than the counts. Um... And right. all and the report assessed symptoms, um, mm -hmm. and you kind of see that pattern for all of them except for like when you're just after the, like the first dose, which is where you're effectively not vaccinated until your immune system kicks in. Yeah. So, and this the second part B compares Delta versus Alpha. Delta's in green, Alpha's in red. Delta again t tends to be doing a lot more, uh, a lot better. I say a lot better. It uh, it tends to be replicating more. It seems, <laughs> more people tend to be getting infected with it than alpha after the first vaccine, mm -hmm. and that kind of uh, changes up after all, it, but not by much. Again, these the confidence intervals are quite big. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, all these things. The the dots are sitting inside of the lines <laughs> inside the yeah. confidence lines of the others. <clears throat> But yeah, the only one that it doesn't wear is, is the, the Chadox, where that looks like it's not doing especially well at Delta after the first vaccination. But the mm. problem is with these studies where they're doing so many comparisons, sometimes you get things that are slightly out there. Um, but mm -hmm. it could be. But I think the main the main thing I wanted to focus on is the loss of protection because they they do focus on the the fact that the BNT one six two B two seem to lose protection faster than Chadox. So uh, here we've got mm -hmm. graphs like 1.0 would represent no vaccination, and then these are like kind of pr the percent of protection compared to people with vaccination. So the idea would be uh, like Bio BioNTech would give you 80% uh, protection initially. Chadox would give you about 60 or 70% protection. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. as time goes on, you see the 
the BioNTech does seem to decline and the Chadwick's doesn't, but they all seem to be going towards the same baseline. So essentially what this paper seems to be saying is that Chadox seems to be doing okay and BioNTech seems to be like just going down towards the level of Chadox. So the mm -hmm. so I think that people are worried when people talk about like vaccine waning that that they're talking about the vaccine will lose its efficacy completely. But what we're seeing here is actually um so wait, remind me, what vaccine did you get? <laughs> so basically what they're saying is that you're going to be coming down to my level at this point of... <laughs> yeah so, yeah because <laughs> i i got that astrazeneca vaccine and so right. now all those people who are who are really really like kind of proud of getting biotech you know you're coming down to my level now <laughs> welcome to the astrazeneca detergents. um <laughs> but yeah um but they also like in figure three I think they try to separate things in later figures, figure three and four. They're trying to separate things by CT yeah. as well, um, and just say that like, um, like what are the CT values for the people that um, test positive? And I think I, maybe I'm focused a lot on figure yeah, three this is C here. Um, so yeah, because they're sort of showing that um, for the people that like there are groups there i guess right there are groups that emerge of um after people have a higher viral burden and some people have a lower viral burden yeah so it does seem like they've got they did try to break this out into groups they've got this so firstly see count values so count values are like is essentially the number of rounds of R rna replication you need to do until you detect rna essentially so mm -hmm. having a low count value means you've got lots of RNA already, whereas having a high count value means you're putting in a lot of yes. effort to make sure you can see the the RNA present. So we've got um, right. So we've got this weird like distribution that 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 the, they're basically saying is splitting into two distributions, where you've got this in red, you've mm -hmm. got like the uh, the low count value, which is the people who are actually very like infectious, and then you've got low fat count value, which yes. is taking up most of the population are at, lo at the low count value and that, that's in blue um so right. and are all of these people uh not all these people are vaccinated in this particular oh this is the overall yeah this is everybody but in but in a they split it up by people who are vaccinated and not vaccinated yes i, th I think they do <clears throat> uh so let's zoom in on a yeah yeah zoom in a little bit and let's look at that yeah. So the, yeah. So in A, they have three different time periods, <laughs> and then they have not vaccinated in each of those groups, and they also have after dose one and after dose two, and the CT values are oh hey, wait, right. You can kind of see this right. Like by the time you get to the third time period, which is presumably oh no, because it's going to be different. I guess the third time period is just um, maybe different strains are is what is is affecting that one. I mean, uh, yeah, we, we don't um, necessarily know. Um, yeah, because they're still they're still sorting people by the time after dose, right? In each of the yeah. each of the figures or each of the columns. So then the only difference that separates them, I mean, the groups are changing. Maybe the size of the groups. Uh, that's actually a big but confounding thing. It, yeah, there are lots of <clears throat> confounders. I mean, firstly, Delta variant. That tends to have well, we've seen other studies that say that it has a much higher count value, even people who are vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, that could be a, a major confounder. It could, there's lots of different things. So for a right. date like this, it's very but hard it, to to pull out what's happening. Right. But but I think that that's what how you could interpret that final one, right? It could be that's Delta variant, right? Kind of giving everyone the same amount of burden, no matter which um, no matter I mean, which group they fell in. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely, like, one explanation. It's a very tempting explanation, but I, I do realize that I'm pulling out a lot more than this graph might necessarily be telling me. But that, that's yeah, just... Yeah, the, the graph in is the, a graph. In, uh. in the earlier ones, you can definitely see that the not vaccinated groups have, like, much lower CTs. Yeah. Right? Meaning that they're experiencing higher viral burdens. And that trend sort of holds. Again, like, you can see how crazy these interval lines are, though, right? Like... Mm. Uh, there's like lots of variation in people, um, but like as you move upwards through those bars, right? Like the CT levels go up, meaning lower viral burdens, um, and that's also like the amount of time passed. That's also the yeah the amount of vaccines you have, right? Dose one 
versus after, sometime after uh, dose one and between dose two and then sometime after dose two. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I think those those are the main things I, I wanted to take away from this paper. There's, I mean, there are a few figures that I, ha I have not had this. So if you actually want us to, to delve in this paper so I can understand what this figure says, then feel free to talk to us on Twitter. <laughs> but I wasn't able to at the, yeah. at the time, unfortunately. Uh, so, but I think... I think the main takeaway is that yes, seems it seems to be that the vaccine is waiting for by, for the Pfizer vaccine, but not actually much lower than than that would than we'd consider protective. So it's you're probably right. going to be fine. It's I don't think that that we need to to panic too much at this point. I mean, no, we're already panicking. But... And they do in table in table two can we go to table uh, two, table two let's quick? see if i can go down to table <clears throat> two uh table two da, 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 da. page 25 yeah it's that one and you zoom out a little yeah so here they really are trying to figure out they're trying to look at with the different vaccines at different mm. times after the vaccines have been given who falls under the different CT right. values, yeah. <laughs> right? Who's over 30 CT or under 30 CT? Um, I wish they had like an easy metric to say like the comparison without actually like comparing the numbers myself. It doesn't seem like they yeah, do it's, that. Yeah, <laughs> it, tables like this, um, I can boil, boil my elbows looking at them slightly. Uh, but yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> but 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 they are trying to get at this question right in this paper i, I guess that's that's mm. sort of what i'm trying to say like something in this paper they're trying to get at the question right like um yeah it like do you see higher viral loads as the vaccine is waning right as you spend more time away from getting that vaccine um but i don't really know what it is uh, telling us here. yeah i'm i'm not not sure uh, again yeah. like tweet, tweet tweet and comment if you want us to to figure this or if you figure yeah. this out and you want to yeah. tell us that that'd be great um <laughs> so yeah, yeah um okay. Let's next see paper next. is uh okay so now we're moving away from this into something different a little seroconversion and fever are dose dependent in a non-human primate model of inhalational covid19 yeah yeah so this is this is uh i'm not sure if people maybe it matters how much uh, virus actually makes it to you in terms of like what your what happens in terms in the course of the infection and so um, of course you can't test that in humans you can't control how much a human can get of mm. COVID of the actual viral particles but in non-human primates you you can and so that's what they've gone in uh, and tried mm. to study in this particular um, in this particular paper so they have a whole bunch of monkeys um, and they've given them uh, different amounts of the virus, and then they follow those animals, seeing like when do they develop, um, when do they develop symptoms, and when do they become seropositive. They also at the very end look at like um, uh, IL six levels, right, as sort of like inflammation. So maybe we can look at uh, let's look at a figure that shows us the different range. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, so on the x-axis there, right, they're looking at the different um, the different concentrations of virus that they've given, and and then uh, you get this probability of response. Either are they experiencing the fever, or are they um, getting an neutralizing antibodies, or are they seroconverting? And as you can see, like uh, I mean, there there are certainly exceptions to this line, but it generally fall follows. Um, a trend, right? Where I guess the data are binary here, so yeah. like you don't get to see like the smooth, right? Like this, but but the but when you fit the binary data to a curve, right? There's a correlation between uh, the more dose you get, uh, the more uh, fever or the more seroconversion you're you're likely to experience. Right. <clears throat> so yeah, there's. Uh, I, I mean, so yeah, they basically like. Give these these uh, the uh, synomolgus macaques, and they give the, them this spray of aerosol, and that aerosol has a varying amount of viruses within them, and and based on that, they then log like kind of what uh, what's happening to them afterwards. So we've got 
body temperature graphs so you can figure out whether they've got mm-hmm. fevers or and then they kind of catalog all the symptoms to see uh what the threshold is to to for them to actually develop uh a fever or not so it's um yeah yeah it's it, and there is there i think of the paper that is that there is a threshold <laughs> right that like right. it is possible that um, like the more the more virus that is getting into these monkeys, like the quicker they are to get a fever and the quicker they are to seroconvert, right? So like that is given that that means that um, that initial dose that you get like does um, template some sort of progression of of the virus in you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is uh, think... quite important. I mean, one of the things I would say is that. Monkeys are not necessarily the main host of SARS-CoV-2. I don't know what. So I think we've. Mm-hmm. I think we looked at rhesus macaques previously, where they they get disease, but it's yeah. not as severe as humans, so it doesn't really lead to any fatalities. So yeah, they clear it. They clear it at the end. They're yeah. Like, so guess, more resistant. The, the mm-hmm. thing that that I need to, that we need to be careful interpreting this is that, that. So when SARS, when a virus like is in an unfamiliar host, the the initial mm-hmm. dose can be very important. It can be the difference between. Mm-hmm. The, the the virus being cleared or it becoming like a fulminant infection um so mm-hmm. and whereas like for some viruses we get like say measles where it's very infectious where you have even a small dose is about the same as a big dose because it replicates so much faster so uh yeah. i mean yeah so the fact that it's not there adapted could be right could be the reason why we're seeing this particular I mean, phenomenon it here. could be but mm-hmm. then again like the, some, they're, monk, they're primates, so they are still very close to humans. So this might actually be very close to the mm-hmm. the human human model, because again, this yeah. SARS-CoV-2 wasn't adapted for humans until maybe a year or two ago, and so mm-hmm. the so this could still be a factor for human infection, it, and that like initial dose mm-hmm. dosage could control. So I I think that there are like, there's an argument here for mitigating that dose. There, there are, yeah. Yeah, there are reasons. There are reasons to say like this is a good model to study this, and there's reasons to say that there, this isn't a good mo- model to study this. Yeah. Um, and that's gonna impact the way that you, the, the way that you take the conclusions of this paper and apply them into into us. And that's like that's the magic yeah. of animal models, right? Sorry like, if you came here. Uh, that's where sorry. the scientific. Sorry if you came here for are. concrete answers. We <laughs> teach the controversy in our house. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and like, I think, you know, people should understand that that underlies like a lot of, of animal model research. Like it is this amazing mm-hmm. tool, right? Like we study all these things in mice because we can run through these things, but mouse immunity is not human immunity. And, uh, we're getting closer when we use monkeys, but we still like, you can still throw out that criticism yeah, of this. Yeah. Um, I do want to say that, uh, it looks like in table three of this paper, they also look at whether or not um, whether or not like you get shedding just like from like how far back do you have to swab to see uh, to see virus right. coming out uh, in these different in these different formats right like if you if you think of like they've given like the range of uh, virus to these monkeys and that means that some of the monkeys have had mm. different outcomes right and those outcomes roughly correlate to how much virus the monkey gets. It also correlates to how much the monkeys are shedding, <laughs> uh, how much, yeah, and how for how mm. long they're shedding as well. Um, like if they never seroconvert, then like it takes a really long time, right? Like uh, it takes it takes longer, right, for them to um, it takes longer for them to yeah. peak. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, that's all I think right. I want to say about this one. Um, yeah. uh, so now we've got another paper called. Oh, this one is a glycan gate controls the opening of SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So this is quite an uh, an in-depth paper that, that essentially it it uh, goes back to using cryoEM to look at the spike protein, and then it puts so so spike mm. protein. We've talked about it a little bit. It's the little hand that grips on that the SARS-CoV-2 uses to grip onto cells. Um, so it has mm-hmm. two two states. So it's got the up and it's the down state. So the up state is when it's opened up, ready to grab. Downstate is where you've got some glycans covering the the receptor binding domain that protect it from antibody uh, responses, and so like in an ideal mm. situation, you'd want it, w- it would want to be in the up condition right before it's like about to attach to its yep. host, 
And I know now when we talk about the alpha yeah. variant, there was like some early papers about it where they found that it was that that tend to be in the up configuration more often, and that meant it could infect cells faster, but also meant it was still vulnerable to antibody responses. Um, I don't remember talking about glycans ever. This is the first time I remember. I I know that like there was the language of like um, open and closed. Yeah. Or, yeah. Open and closed, but that was also I think that was part of the pre-processing, if I remember correctly. Like there's also like uh, <laughs> like it, depending on if you got uh, cleaved earlier or later, like that can also influence this confirmation. But here they're saying like part of um, oh it's still the protein that's moving. It's just like this part of the protein has some uh, yeah. triggers. Yeah. So they don't actually yeah. know what. So they haven't gone down to the point where they know what triggers it. But they do. They have been mm. mapping the sugars. So in this case, they talk yeah. about n acylate. Uh, sorry, um, sorry. Uh, n linked <laughs> glycosylation. So n in this case okay. refers to asparagine, which is an amino acid that is able to get glycosyls attached to it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, this is one way where proteins can cover themselves in sugar, and it's a it's a bit different from like say. I so I think in this case a. Yeah, they, they use a new unique strategy to com computationally predict the structure of the spike protein. So I think the main... So they take cryo-EM data that other people have gathered before and they reanalyze it um, mm -hmm. and then use their models to create some, some videos of what it's what's actually happening. And what they seem... So they're huh. taking like some very advanced software and they're looking at what, like the open and closed state and... Check, check his, and modeling like okay mm -hmm. well what does it look like when it flips open and how long does that process take um and uh they so they've, they've managed to simulate it and they they came up with this idea that there's a glycan gate oh, there's a yeah. set of glycans uh, that push the receptor binding date domain from the uh down to the right. up confirmation and then so the blue the blue in this particular figure is like those predicted yes, like that's right. positions. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's that's wild. Yeah, so like I mean, I don't think again, I, I don't think we've talked that much about like this this layer of structural biology that like you can find the shape of a protein uh given the amino acid and then you can like express it and you can like crystallize it and stuff but then there's all this other stuff that yeah. can get stuck to it and e and that could be influencing the function um right okay <laughs> yeah uh and so they do they run some simulations and that this they come up with this idea of the this glycan gate glycan gate that is responsible for switching it mm -hmm. up and getting it to open open up but mm -hmm. that's not enough they they also use some uh Biolayer interferometry to confirm it. So th this is a way for so a uh, quick refresher on biolayer interferometry. You got some, you got like a sensor. You got some proteins on that sensor. They shine yeah. light onto the, the so it's, uh, white light. And if the proteins change shape, the light that gets reflected back will be slightly different. And that's and through that we can yeah. predict that the, that there's a change in binding or that something's happened to the protein to change its shape. And that's like the one sentence, yeah. super, super dumbed down and explanation. So yeah, so that lets them know shape or not. Like they, that lets them see a change. And the way that they um, try to induce that change is they yeah. make a bunch of mutations. They make alanine. Yeah, they remove a bunch of the residues. Uh, uh, and I guess interestingly for their hypothesis, the residue that they think is going to be yeah, glycosylated. That's right. So this, they focus in on this N343. Yeah. Uh, which I think is, is is almost like the mm -hmm. kind of yeah the main like kind of switch the the gli the gate uh, of of it yeah yeah that that's the that's the residue that's gonna hold the the bulk of these uh, glycans that they think is responsible for some movement and so when they get more of a response yeah uh, hmm. yeah um so it's got some yeah. really nice videos I I don't know whether I can show them or not I didn't uh no i i so let's... yeah no, that's fine let's let's move on but like i this is an interesting paper from that sense of like we've never we've talked a lot about like mutations on the spike protein changing the way things move in terms of like the amino acids right like oh like this hinge or like the we talked about cleavage oh nice 
Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so they got these really well, we... lovely little videos on it. It's taking ages to load because this video is over 100 megabytes long. So <laughs> it's... It, but it's worth it because look at this thing. It's, look at this wobbling. Because you've got these blue gl glycans wobbling around uh, on the surface. Yeah. You've got, I think... The... But we haven't... What's interesting about this paper is, yeah, like we're talking about they're focusing on the blue wobbling thing, yeah. which they're attached to amino acids. So, of course, changing amino acids could have a difference in it. But, yeah, we don't often, um, yeah, we don't often talk about it as like what they're actually doing in terms of the function of these proteins. Yeah. So I think this video will kind of sh show the, the model of like, so at the moment, the spike is closed. Uh, so now it's in the down position. You've got... Uh, so you've got, and now it's going to like, so you've got the RBD, I think that's the bit in, it's not the bit in purple, uh, so I think, uh, let me double check this quickly. Uh, no, it's in the, I think the RBD is the blue. Yeah, it's the light, RBD the, the is light, the, light, the blue, light blue, and the yep. uh, N43, that's, the N343, that's the important, like, glycan that we're looking at. Uh, that's... Yep. No, no, that's the important amino acid that has a glycan attached yeah, to it. Yeah, you're right. And so you can see, it's like so it's so close to the RBD, but it's not quite in the RBD. But the idea is that they're saying that something blue, a dark blue thing, kind of sticks out of that and like is blocking. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> and so it's it moves to a transient conformation. So it's so it's start, so you see the gly glycan is kind of like wobbling around a bit and it's pushing. So it's. Uh, okay. So. We're, we're, I'm trying to talk because this video is loading very, very slowly because <laughs> the internet hates me sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, come yeah, on. So this is in the middle. Okay. So and now I, it's like... Oh, we, yeah. It's yeah. further away now. I see. So, yeah. Essentially, the, the, that glycan pushes it open. Um, so, yeah. A, a fascinating... Oh, uh, they're saying... They're saying the glycan pushes it open. Yes. Not that it blocks it. Yeah, I see. It kind of like <laughs> does a both, both like almost like a latch, I think. It, yeah. Yeah. I think they actually use in the phrasing they used was it's like jazz hands or something like that maybe. Um, <laughs> no, actually, no, 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 no. They use uh, hand jive motion is the phrase they use. Hand so. jive. Okay. Yeah. I mean, not quite jazz hands, but certainly some sort of strange dance move. Okay, so let's see this from the beginning because now it's theoretically it should load. So you got your close spike and you got your n the 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 n three four three glycan kind of rubbing against the receptor binding domain and it's entering this transient phase. Mm -hmm. And then you you see it's going to suddenly do a flip to be open. So it moves up. So you see the other glycans move around it as well. And it moves to a different position. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we've talked about, I think, okay, now that I see this picture, this picture is like, that's the trimer, right? And we just saw one part of the trimer go from closed to open. Yeah. And we've talked about that before in the sense of like on the hinge, right? Amino acids there making it more or less flexible. But this time we're talking about at the top, there's also a latch <laughs> that's that's potentially made of an amino acid that has some glycan on it. Okay, cool. cool. Uh, so Nick, next... that's great. I feel like uh, I absorbed as much as I would, even if I read this <laughs> one in its entirety. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is again going back to cryo imaging. So uh, this one is looking at a relatively bigger picture. So what this paper does is it uses mo so it uses cryoEM, but also tom tomography, so taking multiple slices of cry at the cryo-EM level and then putting them together to make like a 3D image of the cell. So we get this uh, mm -hmm. this like mm -hmm. massive like image of what what things look like in the cell, and you've got like a th a three dimensional representation of where SARS-CoV-2 is in the cell, and they yeah they can we've use seen this... we. So, or, or like one of the early things that we covered was the the same technique, but used to look at the pores, right? Like the pores that form on the SARS-CoV-2 outer membrane structure or whatever. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's right. And we've looked at it to look at like the replication organelle, which is when during yeah, SARS-CoV-2 replication, replication, they form vesicles because uh, the host immune system really reacts to double-stranded RNA. 
So, so when mm-hmm. SARS-CoV-2 replicates, they create their own little organelles to protect them from that. And so these are like the vesicles in blue. Um, yeah. And this this paper looks at almost every stage of that process of when it from mm-hmm. from when the DNA goes in to when it starts to form these uh, replication organelles. Um, so you've got like these yeah. these double Sorry, membrane. I said outer membrane. I meant I didn't mean uh, replication organelles. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah. We definitely did look at the uh, the pores for the outer membrane. That was a different. We looked at a couple of different yeah. papers on on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's the pores for the outer membrane of the replication organelle, not yes. like the outer membrane of the cell itself. It's like these are double membraned, essentially organelles that the virus is inducing inside of the cell so that yeah it can be as you said shielded from the immune system yeah and so it goes from that to looking at the SARS-CoV-2 assembly and the budding so like where it happens in the cell and how that process takes place so so like so it kind of transitions from double membrane to single membrane vesicles uh where the viruses Mm -hmm. get built up inside of them um so you've got like so this is one of those great papers yeah. where they've got a great technology and they're just pointing at stuff to see what it can tell us, and so that yeah, so but uh, this observation to me is actually really big because this is what I was trying to allude to earlier, right? We were talking about syncytia formation mm. because the spike protein is going to appear on the surface of the cells, mm. but like in what circumstance does that actually happen? Because in this particular instance, right, those, the membranes that have the spike protein are inside of another membrane. <laughs> yeah. So right? inside of the cell. Yeah, yeah. You, you're right. Cause it actually looks like the viruses are being so, uh, let's see if I can zoom in on this. So, uh, so we, so like in this, so I'm going to zoom in on D cause I think that's the most like easiest one to, so like single yeah, membrane vesicles colored everything. Yeah. So single membrane vesicles in gray, the uh, spike proteins are in red and the viral membrane are in orange. So you can actually see these circles of the virus being being made. Um mm-hmm. and seeing the mm-hmm. spike protein localized to them. So yep. so in order for citizen city to happen, you'd need the spike protein to be on the surface of the cell. So from this paper right. it's not quite clear how these spike protein being created in this kind of very internal compartment, how would that would go to the surface of the cell? Yeah, I guess later, I guess the idea is that that internal compartment eventually fuses with the outer membrane to release the particles. But at that point, right, the particles are released. That's like a later stage of egress in that case, right? The, the, the cells will eventually have spike protein on the outside, but it's gonna be after they've released some amount of, of virus. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think the the, the question is like, um, like when they get released. I mean, I, I assume the spike protein isn't just going to be on the SARS-CoV-2. There might be some crossover with other membranes potentially. Because yeah. no, I think that I think there's spike protein probably on one of the membranes in the double membrane like replication complex. Yes. Yeah. It does seem like that in in one of. Like if you go back to that D image, right, the, the the set of membranes that's just like, I don't know, to the left of prominent orange thing that they're pointing to with, they're pointing at three, the middle orange thing that they're pointing to an arrow, that looks like a little chunk of membrane, right, that has spike protein on it. <clears throat> like yeah. that's, that's, that, that it's forming. It's, I presume it is a, a replication complex that is, like in the process of being formed. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's cool to see that the spike protein is being recruited to that surface. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, there's all these, things... um, these replication complexes are um, like p- people are understanding more and more, right, about what's going on. I actually passed up a paper this week talking about uh, a whole host of uh, proteins that SARS-CoV-2 has for this process. Um, right. And like knocking them out and seeing, yeah, the the proteins that actually govern the creation of these uh, membrane vesicles. Because, you know, the the body doesn't want to make these. This is, this is no. SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> asking for them. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, so it goes all the way out to the final bit of SARS-CoV-2 exiting the cells through what are described mm. as tunnels. Uh, so, yeah, 
exiting through tunnels connected to, to outside of the cell. So it's it's interesting because like you don't so you've got like the, the so I haven't really seen that that before previously because um, <laughs> uh, yeah and it's going to like go into the like, the full model that they've uh, mm-hmm. yeah so people always talk about these uh, vesicles as shielding the mm. the viruses from the immune system but like i guess i just assume that then the viruses go out and fuse and get out of the cells or maybe i assume the cells lysed and they came out but here it's like yeah there's another membrane fusion event of this particular membrane um that just puts a lot of importance on this membrane too like what proteins get recruited to this surface and like what's the identity of this membrane because that's um yeah that's the factor in in having in the viral life cycle yeah, so this is so this basically like goes into a lot more detail than we've seen before into the virus life cycle. It and it does, yeah. and it's kind of interesting like where it pull, pulls out like various things that we haven't thought so, thought about before. And yeah, I th- find that quite mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, again, I, I feel like if we did choose to dig into this one, it would be nice to know like what other viruses is this known in other viruses or is this just like, you know, this is the confluence of like a real hot virus that happens to have this mechanism and the technology to actually see this, these things happening. Um, Cause I, yeah, for me, this is a like totally new thought about the mechanism of egress. Um, I just, you know, haven't, yeah. I'm not a big thinking about viruses day in and day out. <laughs> uh, so moving on to the okay. n- next paper, which is, Oral, va- uh, oral bacteria combined with intranasal vaccine protect from influenza A virus and SARS-CoV-2 infection. Yeah, so um, this is... I, I don't think this is necessarily about that much about SARS-CoV-2, more about uh, trying to induce this IgA immune response. Mm. Um, so we we talk a lot about IgG, um, especially in the course of hearing, seeing all these clinical trials for uh, vaccines and the correlative immunity being IgG levels and right when we talk about waning all this time we've been talking like waning immunity and stuff like right, levels go down what does that mean um, but IgA is another body that exists not in the blood but on mucosal surfaces so like on the sticky parts of uh, inside of your well inside of your gut and inside mm. um, and people are really interested to be able to make vaccines that um, induce more of an IgA response because if you think about it like that's the place where you're first going to see these viruses lay down uh, respiratory viruses but also um, mm. uh, gut viruses if, if that's but in this example it's two respiratory viruses um, and so yeah uh, those mucosal surfaces uh, people because they're always exposed to the outside of the body um, they're thought of as having like really unique immunological principles that probably have interplay with microbiota because inside cells, right? There, there's some balance of like not reacting too much to the things there versus, um, yeah, versus, uh, actually reacting. And, uh, in this particular study, they are, um, they're you they're co-delivering almost like an adjuvant of a sort right uh, uh into the into the nasopharynx um yeah. in order to uh, elicit more of a iga immune response <clears throat> yeah and it, it does seem to so they do an, uh, some interesting things where they uh deplete the uh immune response i uh, not immune response they d- deplete the microbiota and microbiota by like mm-hmm. giving antibodies and uh, not antibodies antibiotics antibiotics yeah antibiotics mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and uh lysozymes to try and see what effects that that has on uh mm-hmm. influenza uh, resistance it's quite interesting i mean antibiotics are probably the least subtle way to modulate our microbiome but it's it's definitely a thing that can be done um yeah, yeah, like I guess, I mean, it's an, a very difficult type of test to do, but you sort of want to see these, I guess it's kind of weird because um, like this this phenomena is probably predicated on having like a certain well-developed immune system. Yeah. So like it'd be, it'd be weird to do this in a notobiotic model, yeah. right, where you don't have any microbiota because I can't imagine they would 
<laughs> respond the same way. Like there's a real there's a real tricky elements here right like to be able to study because like normally there is microbiota in these areas but like they kind of wanted to like remove it to see like the effect it might have um but in the later ones they do just um they do just like admin they don't even disrupt it right they just administer uh, uh, cultured bacteria like as an adjuvant style to see if it Im improves outcomes yeah i mean it's quite interesting so they take like uh, microbiota from a healthy volunteer and they add it to the mice and they find that that seems to uh, so a human bacteria into a mouse yeah. and then see how that affects the uh, and IgA response and apparently it helps I think um, yes yeah yeah it, it, it does and it, and it does so also what what I appreciate about this is they try to get into the mechanism it, it does it in a mighty 88 dependent manner yeah um, so like they require a specific immune signaling protein part of the immune system in order to have this effect happen so it speaks to this idea of like uh some sort of crosstalk in the immune system where it's like you get this uh, first of all it's totally bizarre you get this yeah bacteria from a human in, instilled into the nose of a mouse but there are immune systems in the mouse that recognize that and mm -hmm. help boost the immune response to then that vaccine strain that gets added in yeah i Thing, the thing I found quite interesting about this is the, the theory of why the adjuvant effect happens is quite because the the idea that the that reason why we have this adjuvant effect is because of the way the microbiota modulate the immune response. Like mm -hmm. that's kind of an interesting thought uh, that I that came up for me when I was right, reading this. Um, so yeah, like because because uh, in an I infection think... you're getting it, infections usually uh, uh, have lots of damage associated with them. So you're not just getting like the your infection in the oral surface. You're getting all those oral microbiota just suddenly spilling out into certain areas as well. That might also be like an additional signal for immune system to say this is actually causing damage. We should do something extra. Um, oh yes, yes. Oh, I like how you take yeah. I like how you took that and put it in regular infection, right? Like this system is already there right like maybe that's why we've had trouble with eliciting the iga response because it's like very dependent it's very evolutionary dependent right on like something that's happening in a regular infection yeah because like when we're giving yeah. a vaccine we don't want to <laughs> cause damage but damage in itself is a signal for the immune system so right uh, right an adjuvant is a way to <laughs> mod to, to like simulate that without actually causing damage so yes. that's yes. quite an interesting thought that I, this paper brought up with me because they're essentially using their microbiota as an adjuvant, which is just like, it's quite an interesting application. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I thought it was, it, it's interesting to me for the same reasons. And, and I think also, again, highlighting that fact that like, you know, our immune systems are like really, they're, they're tuned to so many really strange signals and we don't have a good, we have a grasp of it, right, these days, but it's not like a perfect understanding of, of the signals that it's attuned to. So when people do vaccine development, it's a lot of playing around with those signals and trying to find that way to like elicit the response that we want. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, mm -hmm. I don't understand the immune system at all that much, but I'm hoping that we, <laughs> as a scientific enterprise, will understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think we, as a scientific enterprise, we understand it to a point. <laughs> yeah, in the same way that say, yeah, we're understanding fusion. I don't not understand fusion at all, but we, as humanity, are starting to understand fusion. As humanity, yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't mean to imply that I have some special insight into these <laughs> things. <laughs> oh. Okay. Next uh, paper. What's next? A novel decoy strategy for polymyxin resistance in A. cyanetobacter baumannii. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So in this one, um, so A. cyanetobaumannii is like, um, it's an emerging pathogen. Um, and also people are particularly worried about it because it has high rates of antimicrobial resistance. Um, in this paper, they go in and they look at resistance strains and non-resistance strains. They even evolve um, a strain to become more resistant. And they notice in the ones that are resistant, when they look at uh, EM images of them, they see like these weird bits of membrane everywhere. Um, mm. And this is new. 
I actually was not super familiar. I haven't, I'm not super familiar with outer membrane vesicles, but um, it was increasingly popular <laughs> as I was leaving grad school to talk about like, what do they actually do? Mm -hmm. um, so there's membrane blebs that come out of bacteria and they can be, you know, enriched with different proteins and people think they could like fuse into other bacteria and send signals maybe like tiny like vesicles that you like um, shoot out into the world. Uh, but in this case, they're actually attributing a different function to these outer membrane vesicles. Um, well, first of all, they figure out like a genetic determinant, like they find the genes that make these outer membrane vesicles. So they have some genetic control over uh, what strains get more or less outer membrane vesicles. Um, right. Yeah, this is. Yeah, actually, you, yeah, I, I, I they, skipped over, didn't I? Um. You no, know, no. They, yeah, this is perfect. This is the one. Yeah, they, they do some genetic. They find these genes. So here are a bunch of different genes. Uh, in some of the mutants, they they see fewer uh, outer membrane vesicles. Well, I guess first it's just the expression of them to make sure that they were successful. But then also, yeah, of them. I guess that's B. Oh, oh no, that's like uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's weird. We we haven't talked about this before. I'm not gonna. Yeah, uh, dote on this technique. Two yeah, dimensional gel electrophoresis. Is, so, yeah. two dimensional gel, like, you know how normal gel is you race in one direction, two dimensional gel, you're racing in multiple directions. So, people end up all over the map. So, all the proteins yeah. end up in different areas. So, you have to map them, you have to draw circles and go, oh, that circle's really dark. That must mean there's a lot of protein there. Or, and very wide. That right. means there must be a lot of variation in the protein size. There's all sorts of, and, they only have, and I guess they're not doing right. protein, they might be doing lipids here. I did, don't know. I didn't read the full figure. You no, know, the proteins, but I think the idea is that when they make a knockout, like they're collecting all the outer membranes, and like that is like responsible for one of the big smears. So like in some of the knockout conditions, they see like not as much, and then that's why they know that like they've they've hit on the outer membrane controlling proteins. Right. Yes. Um, but so they they do that investigation. So you know, first of all, they figure out okay, acetam resistant aceto, acetobacteria seem to have more of these outer membranes. They find some genetic control over that, and then they find it's these outer membrane vesicles that actually contribute to the resist figure. Next figure, okay. Yeah, they figure, oh, these outer membrane vesicles, they actually contribute to the resistance. Um, and they can do that by, I guess, putting in, um, yeah, they can put in outer membrane vesicles, uh, and they can they can see them too by staining right uh, some of these, these dots um, and that's just a really weird thing <laughs> like outer membrane vesicles contributing to antimicrobial resistance that um, they sort of soak up <laughs> they, they yeah. work to pre soak up the, uh, the antimicrobial so, yeah. before they get to the cell. Cells. Yeah, polymyxin B is an antibiotic that disrupts the outer cell membrane of gram-negative bacteria, so it, and it binds and neutralizes to lipopolysaccharides, so essentially you're giving it multiple targets, you're saturating, it's saturating its targets by producing yeah. these outer membrane vesicles, and it's interesting because it doesn't just help like the acyanita bacteria, it helps any other bacteria that's associated with them or that's in colonies with them because it's just yeah. sending them out there and it benefits everybody really. Um, for sure, and I guess that's um, that's probably that's you know that always bodes poorly for the future of using uh, or like the emergence of antimicrobial resistance, right? Because uh, like yeah, polymicrobial infections that happen, this could be a big factor. Um, but yeah, it's good to know. It's good to know these mechanisms so that we can figure out how to how to sidestep them. Yeah, and the, our final paper, uh, which we've been saving to last, which is. Uh, the oral microbiota of wild bears in Sweden reflects a history of antibiotic use by humans. <laughs> yeah, I think this is hilarious, first of all, that like it's wild bears in Sweden that have the the reservoir, essentially, of, of this history. Um, but what I like about this paper is that um, it really goes to show you how human beings have changed the world and... Um, how how fluid the genes for my antimicrobial resistance are between our society and the rest of the biosphere. Um, so yeah, uh, they go in and they have all these fossils of bears that have you know bad tartar buildup. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> on their on their teeth. <laughs> yeah, I love the logic of this. So like, let's say you want to study the history of antibiotic resistant bacteria by looking at say how it spread yeah. into the environment. But the immediate problem is that mm -hmm. the host microbiomes do not survive. They're not preserved after death. 
So mm -hmm. how do you figure this out? Uh, so we yeah. only have relatively recent records to study microbiomes, except in dental calculi, which are these buildups yeah. of biofilms on the t on your teeth. <laughs> and so they found that, that on mammalian teeth, they yeah. build up periodically throughout an individual's life and preserve DNA within that. So using that, mm -hmm. that calcified matrix, you can pick yeah. up a picture of all the microbiomes that this creature has had over the course of its life. And so naturally, they decide to go to bears mm -hmm. because bears <laughs> like do sorts of they're, they're omnivores and scavengers. So one of the things they scavenge is human trash. So so they are involved mm -hmm. with human communities, even though they try, tend not to uh, approach human settlements. They do come into the contest. So they are a good way to a good yeah. signal for if microbiome, if antibiotic resistant bacteria are in like the wild, because also they are at the top of the food chain as well. So yeah. because of that, that means that when they eat something, they absorb all the stuff. So maybe that means that they get more they they get more exposure to all a diversity of antibiotic microbial bacteria. But yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess they they didn't know before they embarked on this study. I think again, I didn't read too deeply into the introduction, but I would assume that this is that rationale that you explained is one of the contributions here right to the field being like oh here's a great system that we can go back in time with um and a testament too to the power of really deep sequencing like people have heard before like oh uh, sequencing like these rare oh we talked about like rare genomes or whatever yes. reconstructing it, uh, rare genomes by sequencing really deeply this is essentially the same thing but like we're reconstructing these communities um from these tiny samples of, of plaque on on bear skulls um yeah and uh they are specifically looking for antimicrobial resistance genes and seeing the prevalence of those through time. Um, so they have skulls of different ages uh, that they're able to um, yeah, extract DNA, a community DNA from, and see, yeah, like they have, uh, there, there has been a steady increase of antimicrobial resistance um, and you can, and it, and it maps out to the time, right, uh, in, of antibiotic use in our society. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, that, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because well, they, they managed to get samples all the way from 1842 up to 2016 because people have been hunting bears in Sweden. Apparently they found out that they can just go back to the, these den these museum-like skeletons and pick it out from the carcasses. Mm -hmm. And so they... Yeah. So, like, one of the things that they noted was that um, that they uh, looked at, like, kind of, because antibiotic prescriptions started to... They we, people realized there was a problem in like the mid '90s, maybe I think, and then they started to mm -hmm. put in much more tighter prescriptions like o on that. And I guess one of the good news is that they have from this study is actually that seems to have worked. So with the with their records, there seems to be a 15 year time delay between the actual like levels of antimicrobial resistance going down to to when the laws was was it implemented. But I mean that doesn't necessarily mean that. Yeah. It's failed. It also because since these are being picked up throughout the entire bear's life cycle, that has to be taken into account. So some bears can live up to twenty years, and so they'd still pick up mm -hmm. antibiotic resistant bacteria at the same. So that, they'd still show up at the previous levels. So yeah. you have to wait for bears to be born after that period of time in order to see an effect <laughs> to, to happen. And usually, that that means that you're looking at a time lag between when a hunter feels it's acceptable to hunt an adult bear and display it in there. <laughs> yeah i i mean just like uh it, it's like interesting to see like uh, that, that this concept i mean that's directly it's related to this idea that like they, they are accessing this history through uh yeah through skulls yeah. um and and skulls right time so then yeah the resolution has these caveats on it um, but still good enough to see that the genes have gone out. I, to me, that yeah. was the most impressive thing. But yeah, and the story could even be pushed further potentially, right? That they see the blip and the decrease, meaning and, and try to correlate that to something that happened in history. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. So, so bear, dead bear dentistry has shown us that antibiotic likes. We can combat antimicrobial resistance if we are careful about about making sure we don't prescribe things and looking after our bears. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I 
Um, and, and also that, like, yeah, this stuff does spread. I mean, we've talked about this before, right? Like, biology is, like, one of my fascinations with microbiology as well is just the fact that, like, these small organisms, like, really bind everything together, right? At that scale, like, you get these tiny little um, uh, trans transmission events and gene swapping events, and you can have genes move from one population to another population, and, and yeah, it's like a, a, a biological glue that, that sticks us all together. Yeah, <laughs> I think that sums up, like, a lot of ba bacteria that... W so, yeah, um... <laughs> We've had a, a really good good week today, so... Um... Yeah, um, next week we're going to take a break uh, for a week, but we'll be back the week afterwards uh, to look for, for more cool... Mic yeah, and we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible we didn't get everything right, so science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions, so if you have any questions, please let us know in the comments. I totally agree. You can reach out to us over Twitter, microTWJC, where you can also um, ask for us to cover something in our deep dive that, that, that we'll be trying at the end. That peer review is a process that we can all participate in and that we hope you had a good time listening to us ramble about microbiology today. If you have something to add or found something unclear, just let it's us know in the comments. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Same here, folks. Talk to you <laughs> in two weeks' time. Bye.